supervision. Um, we're going to really today be discussing and talking with probation officers across the state um, and just really reflecting on all that, that they've learned during this last year and a half, almost two years in the pandemic and what it looks like for them to serve clients effectively um, and, and remotely. So they're going to talk today about the strategies that they've used and come um, came up with um, to, to really use evidence-based practices to effectively help um, with interventions while, while working with their clients. So before we dive in, I just wanna mention, um, our director, John Clavens is here today and I just appreciate him allowing the space for us today to have this conversation. So thank you, uh, John. And we're going to meet all the panelists. Uh, so without further ado, I'll start if, um, Amber, if you could introduce yourself. Hello, everyone. Um, I'm Amber Johnson. I'm a probation officer in Washington County. Um, I work in the dosage probation unit, so I have a specialized caseload. Um, I'm also a cognitive skills facilitator. I facilitate decision points uh, moving on and thinking for change. Awesome. Excited to have Amber here. Thank you, Amber. Uh, Amy, could you introduce yourself, please? Hi, everybody. My name is Amy Novak. I am a probation officer. I run a sex specific caseload in Sherburne County. I formerly was uh, in Anoka County for 10 years prior to Sherburne. Uh, and coming over to Sherburne has been great as far as our focus on EBP and uh, use of carry guides and 10 steps to risk reduction. So I'm excited to share with you guys what we are doing and how we're doing it virtually. That's awesome. Thanks, Amy. Uh, April. Good morning. I'm April Schneider. I am a probation and supervised release agent down at DFL Community Corrections. I'm housed out of the Olmsted office, so I'm in Rochester. Um, I do a lot of different trainings. I train core correctional practices, motivational interviewing, decision points, uh, T for C, facilitation skills 101, carry 10 steps, um, I'm a CPC assessor, I'm a peer coach in Olmstead County, and then a CCP coach. And then I also facilitate um, t for c decision points in CIVISA. So. All these great backgrounds and wealth of information. Thank you very much, April. Uh, Melvin, please. Uh, good morning, my name is Melvin Robinson. I'm a ramp prob probation officer here in Ramsey County. I currently work in a caseload of 18 to 24 year olds. Uh, my skills are cognitive facilitator and decision points, ART, victim impact, the Phoenix program, um, skills training, and also do safety training as well with our coworkers and staff. Thank you, Melvin. And Jerry, please. Thank you. Uh, good morning, everybody. Uh, Jerry Diefenbach, Hennepin County um, Juvenile Probation. I think I'm the only juvenile person on the panel, but. Um, Working uh, in Hennepin County Probation, um, I am currently, for two years now, uh, approximately, maybe a little more, uh, our evidence-based, juvenile probation evidence-based uh, practice work group chair, which I'm teamed up with one of our uh, trained coach practice uh, facilitators, Sean Laird. Uh, which we're partnering TCP juvenile probation in, in working with our administration to advance evidence-based practices uh, uh, in juvenile probation, moving to different uh, areas of evidence-based practice. I am in, within that role also was trained as a carry guide and BITS trainer and have facilitated, I, I'd say about three adult units that we've done that training with. <clears throat> I'm as well a decision points facilitator and probably going on my third year of that, um, which has been what I'll talk about in a little bit has been a struggle in, in providing virtually. Um, and then also I am a member of the statewide case planning uh, work group as well, just really looking at case planning, how that works with CSTS or different, different systems. So I'm glad to be here. Thank you, Jerry. Thank you to all the panelists for being here today to come and, and share their experience and knowledge um, with us about what it's looked like over the last you know year and a half. 
Um, I'm Stephanie Bulo. I'll be hosting today and be reading um, and, and offering the questions that your panelists will be sharing that experience with. I work in Ramsey County um, and I've worked um, in Ramsey County in a lot of different positions and probation positions. And recently in the last couple of years, um, I moved to our transformative services which is we do a lot of um, work with evidence-based practices and training and developing and implementing evidence-based practices in Ramsey County. So very excited to be here. So, all right, before we move into um, anything further, um, I know Carly put something in the chat. I just wanna make sure if you, that you noticed if you're having any um, audio issues or things, we can definitely get you any recording needs later, so. Um, I'm going to ask the panelists a series of questions today, and each of them will have um, some time to respond and just share that knowledge and experience I've been talking about. And then um, I'll also put those questions in the chat um, once they start talking too, so you can see what they look like. All right. So our first question today, um, Melvin, if you could answer today for us this first question. How has your approach to interacting with and supporting clients shifted over the past year and a half? What works well and where are you continuing to adjust? Um, I would say my approach to interacting with clients and supporting them is it has increased greatly because before this, um, before working for the caseload I work with now, I worked in EJJ with um, juvenile offenders. So with juvenile offenders, you kind of have to be on them because they're little people with big ideas. But during that time, I was able to approach that as being more combined with the family because it wasn't about making the needs of the clients to fit the court needs. It was making sure that the family is being taken to taken care of during the situation because there was so much going on. And with schools being shut down, clients lost that contact outside of the home with their daily communication with people. Parents were in a home with children all day that they haven't been in before. So their worlds were upside down. So increasing that family contact, interacting with the family more, seeing what the family needs, not just my clients. And in that aspect, I mean like, as well as um, housing issues, um, food programs, all kinds of things like that. So making sure it was a family connection about that. Um, what worked well, I would say is um, my in mind with the clients, but smart goals, not just setting goals, make two interviews, call me next week, setting the SMART goals and being specific about it, being specific about them. And the clients were really engaged. They know they had to do certain things in a certain parameter and because they had time to do them, you know, in a, in a timely manner. And not all clients follow through. Let's be honest, not our clients are rock stars. We do have some that we got to, you just got to catch them when you can catch them. But the ones that wanted that help, they engage with that help. Um, another thing that would work well was the technology piece, and I mean the technology connection. We at Ramsey County, we were able to work with the Workforce Connection Center, and they provided us with these tech packs for clients. And they came with a refurbished laptop, a mobile hotspot, and a flash drive with job and programming information. And I was able to use that to connect us with clients that set up Zooms and team meetings with me. Um, it was interesting because some of them didn't do it before, but once I taught them how to do it, we connected like that. And, you know, I would get Zoom meetings from big money, low side, whatever, whatever, all these funny emojis. And it was funny because I would get their street names, but they would set up the Zoom meeting. So that I asked myself, what's more important, addressing the title, but they did it, but they were able to do it and connect in a different manner. So that was the most important thing about it. That worked the best for me. And also, <clears throat> excuse me, building on that human connection with that client and that family. That was the most important thing because I have a role as a probation officer, but I'm also going through this situation with them as well. You know, we're all going through this, what we went through and we're going through it together. So building that human piece that I'm here to help everyone and I need to help myself as well, but I'm here to help. And I think last, continue to adjust on this daily. I'm adjusting to this world that we're living in. And I'm also adjusting to this maneuvering our probation field in this world. That's more helping our clients because we're in a position that we can interact. We know how to do things and move in this world because we have assistance, 
our clients don't always have that. So we got to make sure that we got to know who we're serving and what we can do. And we just can't do what's on the core conditions list. We have to be able to do more because people are dependent on us, not just to get through this court situation, but they're dependent on us to get them to the next step of life and to get out of this probation and continue to move forward and not look back. So there's, that's that. Thank you, Malvin. What a great insight and, and information and strategies and just an outlook on things. I'd open this up to the other panelists at this time if anyone would like to add in on how has your approach in interacting and supporting clients shifted over the past year um, and a half and what works well and where are you continuing to adjust? I would, I would just add on it, what I found difficult or and then helpful um, was I have an all girl caseload. So we we're pretty dedicated to making sure each girl has at least one resource program uh, that is designed just for um, working with girls. I see my ex-colleague, Christy Cobbs down here. She helped us develop some of those. Good to see you, Christy. Um, but I found that it, when COVID hit, uh, that it, for me, I'm a very interactive person or probation officer with girls and also with our resource folks. So I found that very difficult to continue that kind of working relationship. So, you know, moving into Zooms or, or Teams, uh, it was a little slower, but we, I did move into that and found that you could still do have that relationship with the resource uh, people and, and that we're working with the girls to make sure we were dotting our I's, crossing our T's, so, yeah. Yeah, thanks, Jerry. Mm -hmm. I was just going to add in as well. Um, I think that's what thing that has been very helpful is setting expectations with uh, your clients. Moving into this virtual world has been crucial for us um, so that they understand that while this might be a virtual appointment, the expectations apply, meaning that they have assignments ready or they have their homework ready. And we can talk later about how we do those things virtually. Uh, but having them have that understanding that calling in on a smoke break isn't going to be enough time to suffice our skill building and skill practice so that they're aware of what, um, you know, just like they would for an office visit, a lot 30 minutes. Please plan for your 30 minutes, plan for us to have a check in, and then we're going to get into skill building or we're going to uh, address an assignment or whatever your goal for the um, appointment may be. But that's been very helpful for our, um, our department. And we've gotten a lot of great response for that. Uh, and we've also found that we've built better rapport with some of those people that may be actively using or in violation and they're less likely to completely ghost and abscond if they're having a virtual contact with us because that they're less afraid of maybe getting picked up, right? Or having that warrant be issued or when they come in the office. So they might actually engage longer with you virtually. And so that has been helpful to try to get them back on track or get them back in programming or treatment or whatever it might be. That's great insight. The expectations has, has flown through and, and continued in the remote setting. So that's wonderful. And you saw some positive results, both of you. So thank you. All right, we're gonna move into our next, um, our next question. And Amber, this will be for you. How has providing evidence-based practice remotely impacted your work towards more equitable opportunities and outcomes? Well, when the Pandem pandemic initially started. I mean, we were, we were having phone contacts with clients. And so for me as a dosage probation officer, we work on that behavior change at every meeting. We went through a few, you know, phone appointments with carry guides and we're going through these on the phone and it just felt like that deeper connection was missing a little bit. Um, COG facilitation was really on hold for us as agents and also for clients. So we weren't able to, to meet and be safe, you know, all of us together in a group of 10 to 15 people. So we really had to regroup and kind of flex and think about different ways that we can engage with our clients. Um, as things progressed, we started using WebEx. So a lot of those virtual meetings with clients were held on WebEx. Uh, it was great because we can have pretty close to a face-to-face -face conversation as we would in the office, but it's just held virtually, right? That 
created a lot of options for people, you know, from a transportation standard, you know, if you're not able to find a ride, you know, to get into the office, we have these virtual options. Um, with the pandemic came a lot of like childcare issues, right? There's a lot of daycares that were shut down. Moms were having to deal with, you know, okay, I, I can't, I don't know what to do here. So this virtual option also kind of played in and, and gave them an opportunity to still meet those conditions of the court, obviously meeting with us, um, but also took it a step further. You know, we were able to continue to work and build on that behavior change in that time and, and build that meaningful rapport. Um, so you think, you know, as things progress, we figured out like oh, WebEx is, is working. That's really great. We also use tools on devices. Um, I don't know if everyone's familiar with that. It's kind of our Mark Carey products, but they're all adapted to um, the virtual setting. It's really cool. I love this because I, I did have to kind of pitch this a little bit to my clients and kind of let them know that, hey, this is going to be okay. It's cool. Um, so we, we started using tools on devices. Actually, we started before the pandemic. But when the pandemic hit, we really increased a lot of a lot of our clients getting um, established with tools on devices. And so one of the things that really stands out for me in kind of pitching this to my clients, I know not all of my clients have a fully set up home office, right? Not everyone has a, a scanner or a printer that they can access to print out a carry guide and work through it with me on the phone. So tools on devices really creates that space where you can actually pull it up on your phone and my clients can type through their assignments and submit it to me. They didn't have to have a printer or a scanner, you know, so it really allowed for us to continue to work virtually in that space where, you know, we weren't having those regular face-to-face -face contacts and being able to hand off paper back and forth to each other, which was a challenge. Um, but tools on devices really, you know, kind of came in and, and it was a great tool for us to be able to continue that dosage work and that behavior change work um, in that virtual space. Um, not too long after that, uh, we were tasked with bringing cognitive skills back in a virtual setting. And so we worked really hard to um, adapt. We worked with uh, the authors of decision points, um, also with moving on and thinking for change to really help facilitate that adaptation to what that would look like in a virtual setting. Um, for some clients who maybe had one condition left and that was to complete a COG skills group, you know, looking at how long this pandemic has lasted, we're still in it. Without those virtual groups, that might mean someone's on probation, you know, longer than a year and a half than maybe than what they need to, to fulfill their conditions of the court. So the virtual um, COG options really were great for, you know, not only just continuing that behavior change work, but facilitating a group um, and bringing that virtual togetherness that we have, you know, been lacking in person. Um, but we were able to reestablish that and Actually, I just graduated a, a group of Thinking for Change graduates yesterday. So we saw a lot of really good things come out of that. Um, again, it, it kind of, this pandemic has brought up a lot of different things. I mean, there was a lot of clients that had health issues that, you know, the pandemic greatly impacted. They weren't able to be in a space with, you know, other people with, you know, underlying health issues. So the virtual options really, really increased, you know, that availability for them, more participation. Um, and I think in doing this, you know, we've learned that we can have good outcomes using this virtual platform. Thank you, Amber. I open this up now to the other panelists. If there's anything you all would like to add. I just uh, think Chris had a question. I just saw hands up. 
Or was that like a hype back? She's giving oh, you the a round of applause. Oh, all these fun emoji things we can do in here, right? Graffiti, I saw that happening too, a little pop up. Yes, really great things that Amber just talked about to really make those connections during a time where maybe um, things wouldn't be so accessible. And so thank you for sharing that, Amber. All right, so our next question, um, April, I'll be turning to you. All right, so from the pandemic to social unrest and everything in between, um, each of us, clients and staff alike, have faced many stressors and crises over the past year and a half. What strategy, strategies have you found most effective in helping clients stabilize while also addressing criminogenic needs remotely? Yes, great question. So um, when I was kind of reflecting over this and reflecting you know, through the pandemic and what I, what worked for me. Um, I, by, I'm by no means a expert in this, but this is really what I found kind of a theme and that's really worked and helped for me and my clients is it came down to three things that I noticed right away. And again, this kind of ebbed and flowed um, as the temp pandemic kind of ebbed and flowed. You know, initially it was just kind of a shock and everyone was shut down and um, you know, no one could find toilet paper. So there was three things that it came down to for me, and it was supplies, connection, and basic needs. And I found that if I just really focused in on those three things, and I'll tell you what I mean by those, I could actually address some criminogenic needs in while I was doing that. And here's what here's my thoughts on that. So initially when the pandemic happened, I really focused on supplies. I, I literally called everybody on my caseload because we were lucky enough to, in Olmstead County to have food boxes. And we could. I called them and I said, hey, what do you need? I got diapers, I got wipes, I got toilet paper, paper towels, food boxes, whatever they needed. I would, we could drop them off at their doorsteps or I would sign them up and then someone you know, someone would drop it off. So that also, I feel like also helped with that building that alliance, like, hey, they do care. They are, you know, reaching out and, and making sure that I'm okay during this, this time of need. A lot of my clients were obviously at home and out of work. And so that supply need and just meeting those needs could address some other things that I'll talk about. The other big thing, um, was, you know, connection. So some of these clients and uh, most of my clients, I'd say about 97% of my clients are all males. Okay. I just have a couple of females, but a lot of my, my males, um, really also need that connection too. Everyone's at home now. And so I would, you know, have initially, it was just those phone calls, um, and then it kind of went into outside meetings down the road and that, you know, and some Zoom calls. But I found that that connection really was what they were looking for. They might not come out and say it, um, but it was that that connecting just on that deeper level of checking in. Hey, how are things, you know, for you since the last time I talked to you, you know, there's a lot going on, you know, and then the whole during the pandemic, it was the whole Black Lives Matter, you know, and we're in the thick of it with the George Floyd up in the cities. And so it was really connecting on all those different levels and having someone to talk to. Um, a lot of my clients some of my clients don't have anybody else to really talk to and trust. And so of course I wanted to, you know, I'm no therapist. So I tried to resource that out to some therapists. Um, but I, I would say many of them just kind of wanted to check in with me, which was totally fine. And ironically, I found that most of them wanted to check in weekly or bi-weekly, which A, was a lot more work for me. I get, you know, it was, but I was okay with that. And um, how I kind of navigated through that was I would be like, hey, um, you know, do you want to check in in a few weeks or are you thinking you want to check in next week and just kind of make it okay and feel that and a lot of them would say next week. Obviously, I couldn't keep that going, but during the pandemic and during those initial just first few months, a lot of them is what that they needed and they needed that connection and I was willing to do it. So. That was that, and, and it ended up kind of those weekly calls. 
which led into a lot of cognitive behavioral interventions, okay? And a lot of it was, you know, doing it over the phone or um, via Zoom. So what we would work on was I took advantage and kind of thought outside the box. So crisis management, emotional regulation, like Melvin said, you know, they're with their kids a lot more. Okay, let's talk that through. How do you think you could have handled that better? Maybe throw in a, a role play or um, a social skill, you know, kind of that's how what I really worked on with these with my clients during these times, kind of having it what was their crisis and what was their need in the moment. Um, and then I also did um, a lot of like verbal thinking reports or, um, uh, or I did a lot of role plays with like, um, if they needed to call for resources, you know, how to make that phone call. Well, let's practice that. What would that look like? And then we kind of role played it that way. So even though it was, it looked a little different, we were still providing those necessary skills um, to build up those, those skill deficit areas. So I found that really beneficial for my clients in, in, in that connection piece. Um, and then basically the third thing I, I said was I really focused on kind of that basic needs. And what I mean by that was, you know, we really focused on sh food, shelter and, you know, uh, housing, clothing. And so um, housing was an issue for some of them, you know, was it where would I stay if I got COVID, you know, you know, so we direct them to the COVID area or how can I get into a shelter or, you know, I, I need programming. How can I get into inpatient treatment? So it was just really navigating through that and doing that again over the phone. It was a ton of phone calls um, and it was just kind of navigating through that. Now you're, you're probably saying, well, but how do those things connect to addressing the criminogenic needs? Well, oh, the other thing with the basic needs, I kind of lumped in like um, if they needed this, like MA. So we're lucky down here that we have like a, a navigator that I can just email and then they schedule that, that appointment where they just can do it all online now or over the phone. So they can get MA, EBP, EBT, um, we have funds that we can help our clients get an ID. So if that's something they need, we can do that virtually and, and give them that type of money. Um, so just kind of, if I felt like, and I figured out if I could meet those three areas, it would be addressing criminogenic needs also. Because so if I'm filling their supplies and they have food and supplies at home, they're probably not going out and you know, committing thefts or stealing or having to you know, deal some drugs to put food on the table or get money at home. So in turn, I am addressing some of those criminogenic needs that needed to be addressed. By you know, having that connection, I was trying to hit that antisocial um, you know, associates where if instead of leaning on those people for that connection during the pandemic and, and not being able to talk to people, if they could you know, try to connect with you know, with me or with some other type of pro-social resource or, you know, like Melvin talked about kind of that family dynamic, how can we work all together in a, you know, quote unquote pro-social way and learn new skills and, and working together. So, um, and then also, you know, the whole antisocial cognitions along with, you know, you have your needs met. So there's, there's, there's other ways of kind of working through things and, and thinking differently about different things. That's where all those CBIs came in. I did a lot of verbal um, uh, CBAs, which is a uh, cost benefit analysis. If they're thinking about, you know, should I do this or should I go back to work or should I stay home or what should I do with my kids? I did a lot of verbal CBAs and um, a lot of those uh, another good one I did was strengths carry guides. I did that. A lot of them, their mental health was down and, you know, their kind of their spirits were down. So I'm very strengths based. So I use that, that carry guide strengths um, one a lot. And I use the, the Todd's um, I, we have access to that. And so I would just put out all of them through that. Um, and then one, um, I will say midway through, I was starting to kind of lose my spirit a little bit, I'll be honest. And I was feeling like I was kind of losing my connection um, because I was kind of, 
you know, I, I didn't feel like it was making as much of an impact because now the pandemic is kind of doing a little better. And so I actually reached out um, to my peer coach and I was like, I'm, I'm not feeling like I'm making that impact and, and, and the, the connection over the phone or over Zoom anymore like I was in the beginning. And we really discussed that. And we have a um, practice model here that we use in Olmstead. And we do the first part of the practice model is just role clarification. And so together we kind of brainstormed and I felt really good about may I just need to go back to the basics and really role clarify with all of my clients and really connect with them again and just say, um, and what I mean by role clarification with them is just kind of re-engage like, here's, here's what I would like out of this. Here's what I bring to the table. Here's what I can do for you. What do you want to see? And what do you need? And really, um, I found that I once I kind of delivered what I can offer again or what kind of my role in the in the working relationship was, I felt that reconnection. And I also felt like my spirit as a PO was like re-engaged because we can also, you know, we need to work on our ourselves too. But the other thing that I really found was um, if I just stayed in the spirit of MI. So, and, and Melvin also, I feel like we're kind of talking about the same things, but um, if I stayed in the spirit of MI, and here's my MI trainer coming out, but if I stayed in the spirit, which is that pace, that partnership, acceptance, compassion, and evocation, even if I was making a phone call over the phone and, and trying to have that appointment with them, as long as I was staying in the, in the spirit of MI, I could feel a connection. And so I just had to try and kind of change my way of thinking and shift my mindset in, you know what, I don't need to be in person. I can still make an impact and a connection because I really feel like I want to use their time wisely and efficiently when I meet with clients. So that really helped me do that. Um, and so you know, now today we're, we're still, some of my clients really still want to meet over the phone some weekly. And I've had to say, okay, you're doing amazing now. And so we've actually used that Todd um, of, um, uh, what is it called? Um, steps to success. So we did the short-term planning and long-term planning, because I think maybe they got too reliant on me and that we just needed to build their confidence of you can do this on your own. But I, I just found I'm also still, you know, doing those three things. If I can meet those basic needs, it in turn addresses those criminogenic needs um, while using those CBIs. And all while this, I was also doing um, decision points virtually, Sibi saw virtually, um, I just started uh, de decision points in the jail again, so I'm pretty excited about that. So I was doing groups during all of this also, and I was trying to, you know, put some of my clients in there to give that connection too. Um, so I don't know, I'm talking a lot, but I just want to end on this one thing. I, I saw a meme yesterday as I was wasting time online, and the meme was... Um, Five plus four equals nine. Okay, that was the meme. But then it says, but so does eight plus one, seven plus two, and six plus three. So they all equal nine. And that just really resonated with me. Like we all have different paths and we can all maybe do it a different way, but we end up with the same thing. So that's kind of what I wanted to leave it with you guys today. And uh, that's me. Thank you for that insight and just examples and wealth of experience and knowledge that you shared, April. There's just a lot of really great overcoming pieces in that and, and how you made those connections and help during that, um, during those times. So thank you for that. Still a little bit of time if there's any other panelists that would like to add anything in here. Well, who doesn't want to be on April's caseload for sure? So that was really awesome. Um, I, I will just add in um, parts that resonated with me as I live in um, South Minneapolis. Most of my uh, caseload girls were live in South Minneapolis. So when the, the George Floyd piece hit us along with in the middle of the COVID area, it was a pretty dark 
dark time for for everybody. I think for workers, for obviously for families and for kids. Um, so I love that because I had one of my girls call crying. She is a mom. Uh, was shortly after the co uh, after the George Floyd protests and all the stores along Lake Street. If you, if anybody knows South Minneapolis, all the stores, grocery stores, they're all on Lake Street for the local folks to get their groceries. The Target was down. The Aldi's was down. Those are the two main places that folks on the South Side go, us included. Um, we're all closed and, and shut up. So we, um, so really moving into that spirit of how do you, how do you connect with, with kids? How do you connect with those families? Um, so we really brainstormed and I love it how you explain it, April, just really staying in that cognitive spirit of let's role play this out. Let's, let's talk about different options, how you can, can, you know, go to a different store or we came up with I'm going to get my probation department to pay for for door dasher groceries and so we did that with her um, and that was extremely helpful for her but just still staying in that getting her to process it through getting her to look at her thinking and looking at her options was amazing and how you explained that was beautiful April so thanks Jerry Mm -hmm. A great insight too, and, and another inventive way during during that time to really meet the client's needs. Stephanie, okay. do we have one second for a follow up for Jerry? Uh oh. Um, <laughs> um, I I'm just curious if you you um, faced this challenge during that time when you talked about. Um, you living in the area where a lot of your clients were at the time and there was a lot of unrest, how did you approach the challenge of, or how did your coworkers approach the challenge with some of their caseloads, um, of, of really facing the situation of a lot of crime of opportunity happening that was driven from emotion for a lot of people and how to uh, how to really strategize with your clients and their emotions um, from really separating and trying to stay out of that. I mean, because that's a lot um, going on for our clients. Um, a lot of people around them are emotional. There's a lot of, you know, crime happening around them in large groups and, you know, stores being damaged and all that. Um, I imagine it was extremely difficult to just keep everyone's emotions in check and have them not have the impulse to step into some of that emotion with their family and with friends and their community mm -hmm. um, and end up in a predicament that would put them further down a road that they sh didn't want to end up in if you faced any of that. Wow yeah that's a that's a really deep question. Um, so I kind of I consider myself lucky and not everybody will agree with this, that I have an all girl caseload. So well, Christy would, would like that wherever she went. So, um, so a lot of the girls, they were upset, uh, obviously of what happened with George Floyd and that whole incident, but they were more, they were equally as upset about the protest because it didn't have it. They weren't involved in that. They weren't involved in the burning and the damage to they were, um, and some of the, a lot of the moms I was talking to were really um, impacted by that. Um, and it was just with the girls, it's like they didn't want anything to do with that. They just wanted to, to stay focused. They wanted to go to school. They wanted to get their, their needs met with, especially if they had children. So um, it was just a lot of talking. It was a lot of staying, you know, thank God, Hennepin County, we were able, we moved into using teams pretty quickly so I could meet with them in person online, um, which really helped for me. Um, and, and I think helped with the girls that they could, we could see each other, we could really talk about the issues that were going on. Um, you know, cry a couple times because it really was a, like I said, it was a very dark, dark time, on, on, especially in South Minneapolis. So, um, but it was just being human. Uh, it was about 
getting educated and really knowing where all the pop-up um, grocery giveaways were going to be um, and, and reaching out to the moms like, hey, there's a pop-up on Chicago and Lake at, at Circle of Discipline going these next three days, these times, and just letting, you know, and a lot of my moms went. And so that was helpful um, with the, with the POs with, with, that were working with the boys. I think that was a little bit more difficult. I think it was a little more tenuous, um, uh, but I think they were doing the same thing. They were just trying to connect on online or not on the phone as much as, because we couldn't go out into the community, right? You couldn't, that's our first instinct is I wanted to get out into, you know, South Minneapolis into the, the spots where I know where my kids are. So, but we couldn't really do that. So it was just getting them on Teams meeting as often as, we, as they could talking about options, staying in that cognitive spirit of like, here's your, what's your options, what's your best options that are going to work for you? What, what is your choice going to be? How can we support you in doing that? So um, I think that's what a lot of POs over here did. Um, I know I did that with a lot of my girls, um, but it was that reg when it really comes down to, not that I'm the greatest person in the world, but I do know meeting with those girls as regularly as I could was what what helped them stay focused, help them get the support and resources that they needed, and then help on how to do it. So um, that's kind of what I, I will never forget some of the conversations I had with some of the moms of the kids of the anger, you know, not just about George Floyd, but um, just the anger of the aftermath of all of the protests and how that affected this community. So, and so it, it just sounds be, like yeah. increasing the contact in those times yes. of crisis yes. were essential. Yes. Very essential, either by phone or by, by Microsoft Teams. Yeah. Thank you. And my last little point is I, I was doing a decision. We were doing virtual decision point during that time. And we just threw out the curriculum and the, the guys that showed up, we just processed and talked um, about what was going on, how they were feeling, um, how they were dealing with it. So yeah, just being adaptive. So great question. Thank you. Great question, follow-up question, Lisa. And thank you, Jerry, for taking that on and, and answering that and, and really talking in depth about what it was like um, while you were in Minneapolis and for you and for your clients. So we're gonna move on to the, to the next question. And Amy, um, this will be for you. So please describe what you have found to be the biggest benefits of remote su supervision. Uh, yeah, there's so many benefits. Mm -hmm. I am such a cheerleader. So I'm sorry for those that think like, you can't do this, you totally can. Um, I, really the biggest benefits come down to the responsivity of the offender and our ability to be able to truly be responsive in a very creative way. Um, I, I mean, I think that anyone that's been in this field for a while would admit that if this happened 10, 15 years ago, we would have been like, no idea how to do this. Um, technology has been our friend um, and it will continue to be. And I think that, that um, this happening in this era with technology has been um, incredible. Breaking down barriers for offenders is huge. Our ability to eliminate transportation issues, our ability to decrease costs on offenders. And what I mean by that is somewhat with transportation, right? They're not having to find bus money. They're not having to pay someone for gas or a ride or those types of things. Uh, Amber addressed this earlier, childcare issues, getting someone to watch your child to come to an office visit because you can't bring them or afraid of what they will act like when they're there. Uh, various different reasons for that. It's, it's been amazing in that regard. Um, in this day and age, everybody has a phone. They may not have a computer, so they may not be able to scan or send back assignments, uh, but they have a phone. And so we'll talk about a little bit, I'll give some examples um, in a minute here about how we made that work and how EVP can still really happen in the virtual settings. Um, and you're still addressing those barriers. Uh, it, April discussed this briefly too, but just the flexibility and the connections with uh, flexibility with appointments, connections with offenders. 
Um, a lot of our offenders, whether they wanted to admit it or not, became very isolated. And those that have mental health issues on top of just the general isolation, we're really gonna struggle. And so being able to have those contacts that may, may not have been as often if it wasn't vir virtual, like April said, having those weekly check-ins with them for those that are really struggling, if you're the only face that they can see in that week, you're building a connection whether you realize it or not. Yeah. Um, yeah. And, and so once you build that rapport and kind of get that with the offenders, moving into doing assignments and getting creative with how to do that became a lot easier. Um, you know, in Minnesota, obviously in the winter, it's huge too because snowstorms happen. And so the ability to be able to keep your appointments with people and do that virtually eliminating the, I have to cancel the appointments or they have to cancel because of weather um, is also a really big advantage for us. And we all know everybody loves to use Minnesota weather and it's as an excuse if we can. So <laughs> that one's out, but, um, and, and I think that we've seen a lot better attendance because it is just simpler, right? Um, there's less excuses when you just say, hey, you have a phone, everybody has a smartphone. There's a built-in app, whether it is a Google Duo or FaceTime, click on it, let's go. Yep. Uh, I think boredom worked in our favor as well. And I think that has been a huge advantage to us because let's be real, we all know six, seven months in the, in the COVID, someone please talk to me. We all still love these virtual visits and these virtual connections because it was a connection. So being able to have those conversations with an offender, whether again, like I said, they wanted to or not, you're a person, you're a face, you're not a puzzle, you're not a TV show. Um, and being able to start having some conversations with them that they may not have been open to if it hadn't been for COVID and for them being born. And so specifically what I mean is like stages of change, right? They're out running around doing what they want to do, not having all this idle time to sit and think. They're not thinking about making changes in their life about their use or their offending or criminal behavior. And now they're stuck at home doing nothing. That's a really cool opportunity and a time for us to take advantage and say, hey, what do you think about this? Or would you be open to having some more conversations with us about this? And because everybody was kind of yearning for connections, we found a lot that was like, all right, I know you've been bugging me about this for a while, but let's do this thinking report. Okay. Because it was, they had the time and they were open to it. Um, so I found that to be really cool and it's continued to be a benefit. Um, I think that the ability to do case management is absolutely a benefit to remote supervision. Um, if they have a phone, which we know they do, they can screenshot anything. So while they not not be able to physically hand us an assignment or a carry guide or a thinking report, we can scan it and email it to them or we can screenshot it to them or use the tools on demand and then still get on a virtual, uh, virtual setting and say, okay, let's go through that. Send me the screenshot back. And then we both have the screenshot pulled up and we're talking through it. Yeah. Um, decisional balance, thinking reports. We use a lot of carry guides. We do 10 steps for risk reduction. So it's our appointments are set up that the expectation is we're going to have a five minute check-in and then we're getting into the to the nitty-gritty of some kind of skill building and so what does that look like um, i'm a sex offender agent we do a lot of assignments from treatment work so i have the workbooks from the treatment programs we work with so they literally open up their book i open up my book and we're talking through it um, I, I think the other huge advantage when i'm talking about programming and treatment is the connection there as well. Um, the ability to have staffing that we may not have been having in the, in the past um, because of distance or just people didn't do it before. So having the ability to sit down with a treatment provider, a CD provider or any provider for that matter and your offender on a Zoom call and talk about what's working, what's not working. Um, you know, you're building rapport with those community-based programs as well, which is always great for us. Um, yeah, I think that was really, I mean, it's been reiterated a thousand times over, I feel like from the other um, presenters as well, but it's, it's really just about connection and focusing on those barriers and how we can do it and getting creative. Uh, and if COVID has taught us anything, it's about 
creativity, the sky's the limit, so. Thank you, Amy. Yeah, lots of great insight around how to continue to make that connection. It sounds like everyone's kind of said in the beginning, there was that need to want to connect. And so that's great that there's that need because then you can really start working on those skill buildings and those different tools that you brought up. So thank you for sharing that. I'll open this up to um, any of the other panelists that would like to add anything that you found to be biggest benefits of remote supervision. I just have to kind of echo along with all of my other fellow panelists. I mean, there's a lot of great things that um, come with, you know, having these virtual options for supervision. But one thing to it really teaches us as, you know, probation officers doing this work, how to be flexible. Because we had to be at that time. We had to, you know, it wasn't just WebEx. One time it might be a FaceTime meeting or Google Duo. And we had to really adapt to what works well for our clients also. Um, and I think too that, you know, we're also in this situation. We've also been able to teach our clients yet another skill, which is using some of this technology stuff, getting onto a virtual meeting, you know, so they're also building different skills too, just as we are. Sometimes we you know, we have to get pushed out of our comfort zone a little bit. And I think the situation did do that, but it, it brought up a lot of positive things, you know. And I just want to add on to that, that um, we as probation officers, we got out of our um, We start doing the work, you know, we had, we had to challenge ourselves as well. Like, okay, they're not coming to us and meeting in the room and they're doing, they're not doing all the work like they had to do before we had to change ourselves as well and look into ourselves, like how do we deliver it? Not just on a check the box, but how do we deliver it intentionally and correctly for our clients to advance further than what they are? So that, I think that was the biggest um, thing about working remote. We had to challenge ourselves. You know, we had all the tools, we had to challenge ourselves into doing a whole, a whole way of thinking and doing this thing. I have a quick question. Um, how did you guys, and maybe this is going to come up the next question about being the, how this was frustrating um, going into this type of, uh, you know, safe service. How did you guys deal with the clients who weren't compliant, who were out there taking advantage, really, of the, of the pandemic? Uh, you know, we weren't doing any UAs. We weren't doing those, you know, those office visits like we used, you know, the whole thing like we're all used to as probation officers. I'm a supervisor, so I didn't have that, that direct care the direct service, but how did you guys deal with those that who were, were compliant and you know violations and um, was just not getting with the um, you know with the show here? I think that you just continue to try, right? I mean, we didn't have a lot of options as far as did offenders recognize that warrants weren't being issued and things like that? Absolutely, and so if that's their mentality what recourse do we have other than to try to connect and try to um, have the meetings and have the discussions about, yep, I understand that it's kind of a free for all right now, but what that's, what is that going to look like for you? And doing the EVP um, conversations about, yep, it's not immediate, but there is going to be consequences of what's it gonna look like? Um, Cause you're right, there, there was just some level of that, but that was very difficult. Uh, but as long as they're, if you can continue to keep them engaged in any little bit, and if they will comply with having the virtual contacts and having some contact with you, I, I think we're still making, making progress. Um, I don't have a great answer other than, right, it, it was, if they wanted it to be a free-for-all, it very well could have been. And it's just addressing um, the aftermath of what that could look like and having them try to do that cost-benefit. Yeah, so the approach I took was um, kind of trying to A, re uh, like reduce the use, and then B, look around, look at what, why they're using, what, what's, you know, kind of leading to the use. So I would do a lot of verbal thinking reports um, or have them write it, but um, 
it would, I'd have them look at what's leading to the use and then try to work on that piece of it. Is it coping skills that we can work on? Is it, you know, some other type of mental health piece, you know, um, or stressors or whatever it was. So I would try to look at what's leading to it and then try to problem solve around that. So that's kind of the approach I took. Um, but otherwise I would just try to build that relationship so that they could talk to me about the use. Um, unfortunately, during the pandemic, I have either known or had on my case so three people that OD'd and, and passed away from OD and then two that committed suicide. So, um, and then many other ODs were out there, but they lived. But so it's a real problem. Um, but that's kind of the um, approach I took was what was leading to it and how can I support, you know, that piece of it. Thank you, both of you, for answering that. Um, Joe, you raised your hand. Did you have a follow-up? Yeah, I had just a quick follow-up, I guess, to Michael's. And obviously, this would just be your anecdotal experiences to the panelists. But, you know, Michael pointed out that we were all sort of forced. We couldn't use those traditional policing mechanisms, for lack of a better term. You know, UAs, random home visits, office visits. So. On the flip side, did any of you recognize, you know, April, you just said, but we could get to those root causes. Did you realize, or have you observed again, it would be anecdotal that, you know what? I couldn't go to those traditional go-to policing mechanisms. I could only do root causes and cognitive behaviors and, you know, those evidence-based things we should be doing anyways. Did, did any of you again see in your limited experience that, oh, you know what? I did get some better outcomes here where it wasn't, you know, sort of that shoot first, try EBP later, I was like, no, all we're able to do are the remote COG stuff and this and that. And, you know, it sucked that we didn't have those policing mechanisms, but in the end of the day, we should be trying to do that anyway. Or I won't answer the question for you, but I was just wondering, what was your experience like with that? Well, I'll try to take that on. That's a great question. I, for me, um, you know, I'm, I've been doing this work for over 30 years, working with kids in corrections. So um, I there's definitely an evolution, I believe, that you go through as a probation officer. So it really, especially during the pandemic, for me, it really came to what am I going to focus on? Because I, I have limited control. Um, I, I'm a lucky, I still say I'm lucky working with girls because our focus is already pre pre-pandemic. What are their needs? What are their drivers? What can we help them do? And who can we get them connected to? And how can we work on the issues that they're they're dealing with? If it's just, you know, Jerry, I need to learn how to talk to other, I need to learn how to talk to white people at my job that I work at, because I'm not used to that. So um, I'm lucky that way, because the girls are really able to go there with that stuff. But I think in, in Hennepin, the real switch is to, you know, we're not going to, we're going to focus on the needs. We're going to focus on the drivers. We're going to focus on cognitive intervention. And we, I mean, we've even changed our, our whole assessment uh, moving to the react assessment, which is more focused on assessing the, each kid's needs. And then their case planning being focused on that versus the criminogenic needs that we keep talking about. And so I loved, I think it was Stephanie said, we're still addressing those criminogenic needs by addressing their needs. Um, so I don't know if that helps. I think I think some of our TAE, our transitional age youth POs, I think some of our EJJ POs really had a struggle with this question and these issues. Um, I think maybe they still do, um, but I think they're evolving. I think they're moving towards Cognitive interventions, getting to drivers, and how can we address those and still, you know, understand that we're still addressing criminogenic needs. So, yeah. so I think it's about a spirit. I think it's about an evolution. Um, I used to be used to, and I'll be quiet, Stephanie. I know I'm probably talking too much, but I used to work with um, high level uh, neighborhood probation kids. Uh, Pers uh, person offenses, so robberies, um, burglaries, all that kind of stuff. 
And I used to be in that mindset of, you know, we got to hold them high, 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 high accountability and any little problem, we're going to jack them into JDC and, and, you know, that kind of movement towards, you know, if I was working back with boys, which I hope I don't need to do ever would be still my spirit of what I've learned working with girls. So. Sure, you can talk as long as you want. I appreciate your insight. And I know that Michael appreciates that insight as well. And Joe, um, for, for that answer for what you brought up. So thank you very much. And this next question is for you. So Oh, dear. Oh, dear. So we'll get to hear more. Um, so please tell us about the biggest challenge you face in using EBP, evidence-based practice interventions remotely with clients, and how you overcame it. Okay, um, so I'm usually a half, a cup is half full, not half empty kind of guy. Um, th but there were challenges, right? I think back, I mean, all of us were dealing with some extreme conditions, right? We were all pretty much kicked out of our offices. We were all pretty much told to go home. Uh, we didn't have that comfort, comfort of the office and having folks being able to come in and see us, right? We weren't able to get out in the community like we normally did. Um, for me, it was a big challenge in not seeing my uh, resource folks that were connected to the girls and having that regular dialogue, that regular discussion. Um, so the, just as a PO, I got to say all, to all of us POs that are here today, we were very, very, very resilient ourselves. And then I think that therefore helped our clients be resilient through a lot of that transition. I will have to even say, even after 30 years of working for Hennepin County, that our administration, they were um, reactive in a good way. They, they understood the needs. They were listening to us POs of what we needed. A challenge always in a government uh, is how long things take, you know, the process of what it takes. So we, you know, I, I will have to say Hennepin County did really a good job of moving, right? Like let's start meeting with kids virtually. And so I think that assisted. So that was the challenge of, you know, trying to call and talk to people, uh, especially kids um, can get difficult, right? I have a difficult time having a long conversation with my my two teenage daughters when they were in the house. So, um, you know, if it's not through texting, it was it got difficult to have a long conversation. So, kids, it was seeing seeing them finally in person. You you had to focus as a PO of what the hell do I do, right? Because you know, we're, we're at home, the kids are at home, you don't know what they're doing, you don't know what they're struggling with. Um, that was very challenging, I think, for me, and I think any PO in this uh, virtual room could probably say that was a, a big challenge. So what is our work going to look like when we're, you know, now that we're all virtual or we're at home? What does the work look like? How do we hold kids accountable? How do we help kids get to court? Uh, how do we help them maneuver into going to court virtually, right? Um, and going through all those evolutions was difficult at best. Um, but when we, how we overcame it, um, I think, you know, so we, what COVID hit in March in Hennepin, we, we my committee, uh, at the JP Evidence-Based practice committee had thrown out pre-COVID that we really need to look at the tools on devices platform. Um, so that was already proposed and thrown out there. We were already looking at costs. We were looking at the feasibility of that changing. So our um, managers, Gerald Moore and, and Donna Gillitzer, once we all got moved home, they jumped on that, like, we got to do this now. So it was funny, you know, it's like before, oh, we don't know, it's a different thing and it's cost this and it costs that. How are we going to get everybody that access? Well, as soon as the pandemic hit, they, they saw clearly this is a need. This is going to help POs do their work with the kids and, and that it was a cognitive intervention focus. So I think we... Um, we have, it took till May for us, I'm looking at our little timeline that we have written. Um, it took from March to May to actually get a pilot group of probation officers, mainly juvenile probation officers. And I should add, 
pro juvenile probation in Hennepin has been doing carry guides paper version for well over six, seven years. And it wasn't a very, um, how would I say that? It wasn't a widely accepted practice, I'll put it that way. So, um, but we did have the paper version. So juvenile probation was, in Hennepin was familiar with carry guides. Took us to May to get a pilot group together to actually test the, the tools on devices out and then had to do that pilot till August. And in August, it was agreed and recommended by our um, adult um, evidence-based practice committee and the juvenile uh, evidence-based practice committee that we do this um, and that it was successful and that it worked. And so then the county, uh, did end up buying over 300 licenses for the carry guides um, and bits platform. So another challenge was juvenile pretty much knew about carry guides. It was just training on how to do it on the on the TODs um, virtually. Adult, and I'm not, I know a little bit, but adult hadn't been doing any of that kind of work, adult probation. So they're let, laid a challenge. Okay, now we're gonna just throw you this license to carry guides online. We had to uh, work on, okay, how are we gonna do that? So then we, um, you know, plus it was talking to supervisors. It was talking to adult probation program managers who were then getting on board. Um, and then there was a few of us, adult and juvenile, uh, uh, our two committees, adult and juvenile, uh, were trained to train on the carry guides and bits. And I think we have trained at least like five or six adult units on how to use carry guides and bits. So that has been like the big success of we're now moving this into adult, how to use cognitive interventions. Um, and then there was various um, supports that we put in place between our, two, our adult and juvenile committees of doing booster hours for any individual PO or a group of POs that wanted to learn more about tools on devices and learning how to implement that. Like that is always the toughest challenge, right? When we're talking about probation officers, because we're, and I'll speak from myself, it's, I always resisted the change. I always resisted something new because it probably meant more work or something I didn't understand. Uh, so it's just been refreshing for me uh, to help and work with POs. Like it's really not that bad. You're still a probation officer. You're still implementing, you're already implementing uh, cognitive interventions. This is just giving you tool, uh, like a real virtual easy tool to do. Um, so that has been great. And, and the, I love the concept of doing the booster uh, hours. So we've done that with uh, mainly our TCP folks, but I have helped um, really been refreshing to have those conversations with individual POs. And I think that does help change that culture. Um, and I couldn't tell you what our wide usage is of that. I wish I could do that, but I think it is pretty good. I think it's pretty big. Um, and so what I would add on to that, the challenge was initially, okay, and especially in juvenile, we have these paper guides, but we're not in our office. So how could we get them, that kind of stuff? And so when we also really full blown went into using teams with, ki with the kids, it was so easy. I think Amy, I think all the panelists have said it was so much easier and delightful to actually talk about emotional dysregulation and regulation or uh, conflict management or these, these girls and I'll speak from my case. So the, these girls are stuck in their house and arguing with their mom every other minute. And a lot of times those things could get really escalated, right? So really talking about, you know, anger management, um, you know, kind of bringing those emotions and uh, inflammation of that emotion down a little bit. Um, and like I said, the one girl that called me, she was a, a teen mom, you know, I need to really learn how to talk to people. I really need to learn how to communicate. So that is what we worked on. Um, so the challenge was 
moving to that, getting everybody on board to see the merits of it. Um, and I think Hennepin, we've done it. We still got a long way to go. We still have quite a few adult units to still train. In fact, I have one coming up in a couple of weeks. Um, and so I think it's overall well. Now that we're kind of out of the COVID, uh, we're not out of it, but it's it reduced enough that in, in Hennepin, we've gotten back out into the field, which has been wondrous. We're still, the focus is the intervention, the, the cognitive intervention. Um, and, and like somebody showed, you can put it on your phone. I can, the girl can pull it up on her computer and we can do it really quickly. And it's what, what I bring to the training of carry guides is probation officers. You are still the probation officer. You still have immense skills that you have developed all these years. You still know you're the expert in knowing how to relate to each one of your clients. You know their strengths, you know their weaknesses, you know what they probably need to work on. The, the COG interventions that we're talking about is really about how you implement that with each individual client. So it's, it's really about getting to that piece versus, oh, what I am being told what I need to do and talk to about with kids. It's, it's not that. Um, my last little piece, um, I, in Hennepin in Juvenile, we have struggled with, uh, we continue to, to do decision points. There was a little lag. Um, I, I struggle with it, even though I'm a huge proponent for virtual meetings with kids. I still do it with some of my girls when I haven't, they have too much going on, or I've had now a couple of girls say, oh, I've got COVID, and so they're stuck at home. I'm like, well, guess what? Like Amy said, we still get to meet because we can do teams. And um, so we're still working on that work. But decision points in juveniles been in Hennepin's been difficult. So anybody that's got some uh, tips uh, would be great. But working with kids and it's boys, they're not biased. Yes, I am biased, but um, they're difficult, right? It's it. So you, the attendance been really low. I mean, we could have eight to nine, 10 referrals that should be coming and we get maybe one or two. So that has been difficult. We haven't figured out how to overcome that. So we do decision points for our TAY, our transitional age youth boys and uh, then our regular rest of our boys. So been difficult. Um, the kids that have been coming, I think it's been helpful, but it's again about adapting how you do it. Like they don't ever bring their homework. Um, and those who do decision points, they never bring their homework. So it's really trying to take that time virtually to do the homework with them and then having them present and stuff like that. So um, with my final closing statement, I think with girls, virtual was really a positive thing for them a lot of reason what Amy and, and April said about they prefer to just stay at home and have that conversation virtually versus needing to get on a bus, worry about transportation, or maybe they have an interview, or maybe they have to go check out some housing or whatever, whatever. So um, they loved it. And I still think they prefer it, but we're kind of doing balance. So does that answer the question? Oh, it's wonderful, Jerry. Thanks okay. for the insight, especially into your specific caseload and just how it's transferred across for Hennepin County in general. So yes, thank you. I'd open this up to the other panelists if there's anything that you all would like to add at this moment. I would just uh, touch on, I know a lot of counties use tools on demand and they have been highlighted a lot today. Our county is one that does not use them. Um, and I don't think that that's something we are going to move forward with. So it is feasible still to do it without tools on demand. And so I just want to point that out. Um, we, you, like you said, you're on a Zoom call or a WebEx, you can pull up a carry guide. The offender doesn't need to have to have it physically with them. Pull it up on your screen, share your screen, walk yeah. through it with them. Uh, you want to talk about building a rapport and alliance with somebody. What we would do is then we would fill it out and mail it to them. So if it's their case plan, they're getting a copy of that. And you're showing that you're willing to do that work. So when we, when you initially start working with the new offender and we're talking about, here's what I'm going to do, here's your role, my role, you're going above and beyond. And that's just really going to help build that rapport and that trust that you are really there to help them and help them create those skills and, you know, be successful. 
The only other thing I wanted to add, if no one saw it in the chat, um, we did take some time and we made a lot of the other, um, so like uh, the cost benefit analysis, thinking report, problem solving worksheet, things from CCP, those, and then also all the decision points, uh, steps, um, we made those all fillable worksheets um, so that we could do it via email. Obviously, we can't do it through for the carry guides, but if anyone wanted to have those fillable ones, especially if you're not using the TODs, um, just let me know and I can email them to you. Thank you for sharing that resource, April. I, I'll definitely be reaching out for Ramsey County, so that's good. <laughs> but yes, um, thank you for sharing that. And thank you for sharing your responses. Amber, did you want to add something? Yeah, I think one of the challenges too with using that technology piece, I know for us with you know, facilitating cognitive skills, really setting those parameters on the front end. If you guys are thinking of implementing virtual cognitive skills, be it decision points, really setting up those parameters um, for them to be successful in the group. And then also, you know, put something together for them that gives them that instruction on how to join and what that looks like and what expectation um, would be for them in participating in that virtual group. You know, it is a little bit different. We have all the distractions of home, right? The reality is there could be some safety concerns, you know, so for our moving on group, we really stressed having kind of that safe space in your house where you could go to participate in group and not have to worry about, you know, someone else in the home that can hear what you're saying using earbuds. I know for our moving on women, we put together a huge binder and we drop them all off. And along with the binder, we put in earbuds um, so that they could participate in group. And it still protects the confidentiality of the group because you're plugged in, right? Nobody else can hear everything else that's going on, but the person participating. So it really kind of stretches that creativity. Um, and really thinking about those challenges and then finding that solution um, and really kind of bridging that gap. So it, it is possible. And, you know, for every challenge that you face, you, you get creative and you find those solutions to make it work. Um, and it really can add a lot and it really does reach a lot more people. I think one one theme definitely coming across is being adaptable over this last mm -hmm. you know over a year and a half right and really changing and, and moving with not only the needs of the clients but the needs of the staff to get those to to the clients um, and the community so so Stephanie can I add one quick yes, little please. thing I did forget to mention so another piece of equity um, that we addressed in Hennepin was like most of the kids right we're just talking about kids right now. Uh, usually have the cell phones, right? But not all of them did. And not all of the kids had uh, computers, right? Because not all of them were really enrolled in school yet. So most of the kids that were in school were provided laptops from the school. So I, our, another good thing our administration did was they got some of the COVID relief funding and they bought, they took that juvenile, got, got it, got some of it and purchased a whole bunch of laptops. And we were able to get to the kids that did not have that digital access. So um, that was really helpful. That was a big challenge that and how we overcame that. And again, was because our, our administration listened. John, this isn't directed at you, um, but it, the, the administration really listened to the people. <laughs> They really, really did listen, Not, and I can't say this in my 30 years of working for Hennepin County, but during COVID, they really did listen to us in, in the PO's needs for, for reaching kids and doing the work with the kids. So let just add that little piece. John, don't share that, that I'm pumping up Hennepin County so much. <laughs> No, please, Jerry, I, I won't. I promise. I won't. I'm going to see CJ at one o'clock today anyway. So, but hey, and as long as I got the microphone for just a second, I just want to say thanks to all of you. I have a uh, another meeting at 1130, a violence reduction meeting that I have to go to, but it has been a pleasure to just hear this conversation. I am so impressed 
with um, all the great work going on and the panelists, um, some of the comments. Um, Amber, you're talking about the spirit of MI and just kind of mm -hmm. it's alive and well. And I, I typed up something I'll send here in the chat in a minute, but um, just an impressive conversation. And I just really thank all of you for what you're doing to help our clients and the communities we serve and uh, really appreciate that a whole lot. So, um, and Jerry, yeah, you guys do good work in Hennepin County. I, I totally agree. So I appreciate that. Um, Chris Crutchfield, one of our deputy directors is on the line too. So he'll be with you guys until the end of the meeting. So I appreciate again, the opportunity to be here. And thanks again for everything you're doing to help the people. Awesome, thank you. Yeah, thank you, John. There's a lot of awesome work going on and I'm just glad that everyone here is really sharing all this knowledge and wealth today. I have a couple more questions. Um, kind of this next question, we'll leave it open um, to who would like to answer first. But with the knowledge and experience you've gained since the start of the pandemic, what advice do you wish you could go back and give yourself? I'll jump in. Uh, I think just giving yourself grace and being authentic with offenders and showing them that, like, this was all new to us. And showing that struggle is okay. Again, that's going to help build rapport and make you feel, make you be viewed more as a human and not just an authority figure, right? Yeah. Um, you know, like you're struggling with technology. Yep, we're going to struggle. How are we going to get through it? I can't get on that Zoom call. Yep, this sucks. I understand, you know, and just being real with them that we all have those struggles and this was all new to us. Um, and giving yourself that grace to be frustrated and be upset with what's going on and being stuck at home and um, allowing them the ability to kind of vocalize that too and work through it together. Good points. I just jump in. I think um, the self-care piece is the most important thing that we got to take from this time that we're in. Um, a lot of us are concerned about our clients. What are they doing? Where are they at? Are they smoking? We can't UA and we can't do this. We can't do that. But then we got to go home and look at our own situations. Like I got kids here that don't, that aren't going to school that I got to teach at home. I got to do remote work. And it's a lot, a lot of pressure on us, you know, just not our clients, but on, on us as a whole. So we have to just stop and take self-care, take care of ourselves and then take a time to breathe and then focus and get things done. But that self-care piece is so important, especially during this past few years is, how much is important for you and your family with our clients as well with that self-care piece. Elvin, I think you and I are on the same page a lot. I was just going to say I would tell myself to just breathe and I am making an impact. It may look different, but I am making an impact. So I agree with the sentiments for sure on self-care because, you know, we do a lot of these, like I call them Hollywood squares meetings where all of us are in here and it, it, it does drain on you a little bit. So you do have to take really good care of yourself and have that awareness. Um, but also in the same token where, you know, we do have to manage that self-care, not to be afraid of the technology because, right. you know, looking at this situation, which I never thought I would live through a pandemic. I didn't think I would ever experience it at my age. Um, I was like, yeah, no, that would never happen. And it did. Um, and thank goodness for technology because we were able to really continue our work. Um, and that just kind of reiterates that we're able to do this just about from anywhere, you know, and, and we can make an impact and we can continue to change lives and also just, embrace some of it. It is a new skill. Um, and giving yourself grace. Yeah, there's, I am not skilled, you know, helping people through the Android phone app install for WebEx. I've learned that we've had lots of laughs about it with my clients. But again, it's, it's that rapport, we're working together um, collectively to get through this. And I think that there was a lot of uh, positives that can be brought out of this as well. Lots of great insight on all of that. Um, the self-care piece and just being adaptive again. It's this 
rolling theme of working with where we're at and, and, and moving forward. So this next question, we, we've answered it in different ways, but maybe just briefly, we could just reiterate um, what tools, interventions, skills um, did you find translated easiest for, for your remote supervision and how did your clients respond to them? Again, I know we talked a lot about it, so maybe just briefly again, um, you know, this is what worked and um, how that translated for you. This is open to anyone. This number seven or six, I'm sorry. Seven, yeah, okay. um, throw it in the... All right, I, um, I'll start out because I know my prestigious colleagues will finish it. Um, so for Hennepin County, I loved it, whoever said it, but um, it, even if we don't have tools on devices, um, I know still a lot of Hennepin County POs are like, well, I still want to do the old fashioned thinking report. And so I know that there are POs doing that, um, but I'm going to take the obvious answer um, that tools and devices. So I'm going to divulge. I was a hater. I was one of the haters of carry guides and bits in the paper version. I hated. I used to drive soups and people crazy because I would just talk so badly about it. And I and as I evolved and I listened to Mark Carey, we brought him over to talk. And so if your agency hasn't done that, you should do it. He's he caught my attention, um, which is hard to do sometimes. Um, but that got me thinking more about what the concept and what the purpose of tools on devices are, or just carry guides and bits of that that genre. Um, and so for us, for Hennepin County, we really glommed on to carry guides and bits and tools on devices. And that did, like I, I still use them online with girls and it, it is just so easy. It's so easy to interact as an, as an old school PO where I used to yell at kids. I used to just preach to them. I used to tell them everything they were doing wrong and in every, every way that I was going to hold them accountable to now to you, you know, focusing on skill building, focusing on what each girl knows that they need to work on that translates in, in, in person and it translates into online. So. That's an honest answer. I mean, just the progression too of yourself and just oh, how you've seen. evolution. I believe that. Mm -hmm. I think yep. we've all we have all seen that, yes, and in, in our careers. So thank you for that. Yep. Uh, one that we haven't talked about that I would love to bring up is scaling questions. Yeah. Uh, that you don't need any paper. You can do it on the phone. Uh, yeah. They don't even know that you're actually doing any kind of EVP necessarily with them because you're just asking the questions. But uh, and in, for those that may not be familiar with what I'm talking about, uh, the important scale, the confidence scale, how confident are you that you can do that? How important is it for you to do that? They're very different questions, uh, as well as just if you're talking about a certain situation or issue, uh, you know, where are you at? I do a lot of, let's say, depression we're talking about. Hey, I want to check in. How's your depression this week on a scale of one to 10? Uh, are you at, you know, a one to, you know, where are you at? Well, I'm at a seven. Well, last week you were at, a, you know, you were at a five. So that's great that you're at a seven and then you praise that behavior. But then it's the next step as to what can we do? What will it look like to get you to an eight? How mm. can we get you to an eight? So you're still leaving them with these thoughts, right? And this ability to kind of move forward. Um, and, and again, it's a very easy technique to, to implement, whether it's virtual or on the phone. Thank you for that. Yeah, those scaling questions are great and a way to, to really dive in um, and have conversations with clients, see where they're at and how to move them forward. Thank you for that share too. Well, thank you panelists for answering these questions that we've had um, and just really giving your experience and knowledge and background and, and letting us all hear what it's like as you work with clients over the last you know, year and a half, almost two years. Um, so a couple of the panelists have offered to walk us through, you've heard them talking about tools on demand um, and walk us through some of the skills. So they're gonna do a role play for us on what it would look like to use this with a client um, and, and how, this, how this would play out virtually. And so Amber and Jerry have offered to do this role play. 
And Amber, maybe you could just set up what you're going to do and then um, we can move right into it. All right. So again, we've talked a lot about tools on devices, but it really lends itself well to that virtual setting. Um, also, again, the fact that you can use this on your phone, you can sign into it out in the field um, and actually talk through this and review the client's homework with them right there. Um, now that we've kind of migrated back to in-person, um, I'm still using tools on devices uh, mm. with all of my clients. I think it's going to be here to stay and I hope it is because I really enjoy it. And I think my clients do too. Um, we're not we're looking for that missing paper, like, yeah, I had it and I don't know what happened or, you know, so it really kind of eases that. Um, and with the tools on devices, we've got, you know, the carry guides there, you've access to the bits, um, the driver workbooks, all of those different tools that we use. Um, and so Jerry and I figured, let's just role play it, right? Kind of see what this actually looks like in a meeting. So I'm actually gonna share my screen. I can um, talk to you a little bit more about kind of what this landing page looks like. Um, all right, can everyone see that? Oops, are we looking at the wrong screen? Give me a thumbs up if you can see it. Here's my virtual group facilitation skills kicking in here. Awesome. Great. So you guys can actually see the screen. Um, Jerry, are you ready? Always. All right. Always. Jerry, thanks for coming in to meet with me today virtually. I know we, we met last week and we were talking about a lot of different stuff. So I just want to check in with you. How are things going? And we'll kind of jump into our our work that we have so how are things going jerry well it was a bad weekend with the guys probably too much drinking again i'm just going to admit to you that that happened and no trouble but um i'm kind of getting tired of the old group of guys i'm hanging out with so it was not a good weekend yeah we talked so. a little bit about changing that circle of friends that you're hanging out with yeah so that's something that you had mentioned, you know, you really wanted to change that. So let's talk more about what this looks like. Um, what is that change that you want to make? Um, well, I just am finally realizing that I'm hanging out with the wrong group. I've been hanging out with the wrong group. It's why I got put on probation was too much drinking and then doing some damage to property and some stealing that was not okay. Um, and now I have to see you on a regular basis. So um, yeah, I just am finally realizing I need to get rid of this group of friends and it, but it's not easy. So. Okay, you're acknowledging that you've got, it's a big challenge, right? To really mm -hmm. change that peer group. Um, mm -hmm. But it sounds like you're putting some serious thought into making that change and really making that happen for you. Yeah. yeah. All right. Well, let's they're, they're build nothing, on that. Nothing good for me. And I'm finally realizing that all we do is drink and then they want to get into trouble. So, okay. All right. Let's keep working on that. Let's dive deeper. So, yeah. what has helped you in the past when you've tried to change this behavior or maybe a different type of behavior before? What's worked? Well, I think I shared with you a, a few months ago, I was working, I was doing construction. Um, and I do, when I think back, I wasn't, when I was working, we get up really super early. It's physical, hard, hard labor. Um, so I can't, even on the weekends, I can't be drinking with those guys. And I didn't, I let them know I got to work in the morning. So don't come over to my house um, or I'm not coming over. So that was one big change that I realized all right and so I, really, if I think I felt better physically if I think back well that's a, a good thing to highlight right those positive things that we get out of making that change so I think that's great we've got to add that in there so all right so I felt better so as you can see I'm kind of typing this in as we're talking 
But some of the things that you had mentioned was when this plan did work for you in the past, you were working, you were kind of tired with all that physical labor, but you were also staying busy and you felt better. Yeah. There's a lot of positive in that to support that. So very nice job. Mm -hmm. All right. So now let's talk about some challenges. What are some things that maybe hasn't worked so well? Um, well, I ended up thinking that I was missing out on so much with my group of friends, friends, um, that I ended up quitting the job and kind of getting into a conflict with the foreman and just instead of working it out, I just quit and then went right back to the old peer group, uh, and, uh, you know, right back into the drinking, um, They'd either come over, I'd go to their places and yeah, it's the same thing. So, Okay. So how have you tried to create that space between um, yourself and that friend group? What have you tried before that hasn't worked? Um, Well, I try to, well, I I don't, I think that's the problem. I just, I just give into them. Like I'll try to initially say, no, I don't want to go out tonight or I'm not coming over well, then they'll come show up at my house and then it's, it's game on. So I don't have, when I'm centered around them, I don't have any willpower to just say, get the hell out or no, I'm not drinking or, you know, anything like that. Okay. So I don't not that... trying to not, you have you tried not engaging with them. Yeah. Yeah. Um, being able to say no. Yeah. Does that sound right? Yeah. Okay. All right. Not being accepted, feeling like you're not being accepted is an issue. All right. So what do you think has worked for other people when they've tried to make this change or changing their behavior? Well, I, I guess I'll for that one, my sister has really shown me, my older sister, that, um, you know, she used to be in a worse group than I am. And she has gotten us uh, kind of gotten out of that group lately. She's got a great job at the bank. Um, she even just moved out and got her own nice little place closer to where she works. And she is not, uh, she's cut ties with her negative, or with her old peer group. Mm -hmm. um working she's working out again um she's much more positive um so she she, so she's kind of a role model for you as as far as making changes she did a sounds like she did a really great job with that what are some things that that she did to kind of move her to that space where she's now in her own place and doing well and thriving well I think she just started I'm not really sure. I don't talk to her that much, but I, um, I think what she just started doing was getting some, some jobs and just kind of like my situation, getting busy doing that. And then that kind of cut away that group of friends. And she just like, she felt started feeling better when she wasn't drinking and using, um, she wasn't getting any kind of trouble. And, uh, so I, I see that it looked like she just started getting busy with working, having a little extra, you know, having some money, you know, getting the things that she wanted. And she just kind of naturally cut out that peer group. So. Okay. All right. Is there anyone else outside of your sister that has made some changes that you feel like their experience or um, some steps that they had taken could really relate to your situation? No, I think that's kind of the problem is there, I don't have any friends that have done that kind of thing. Like my sister, I mean, I had my, my mom, my, my dad, my uncle are really role models. They've always worked their entire life and yeah, they may drink a little bit, but they've, they've been stable. They have houses, they have families and, uh, but that'd be about it. So. Okay. So Jerry, what are some other suggestions that people have given you on changing Mm -hmm. your group of friends? Well, my uncle and my sister are constantly telling me get a damn job. So that, that would be the big one. 
Um, my dad is on me about maybe I need to get my own place and not be living at home forever. So. So what was their suggestion outside of just telling you to get a job um, and your dad kind of wants you to get your own place? Was there anything else specific about maybe changing that friend, friend group that we want to kind of incorporate in here? Yeah, my, my sister was pretty probably the most explicit in just saying, you know, once she got rid of her uh, negative peer group that she's look at what she's doing and how how well she is. Um, so she she made it made the connection for me. Of, it's the peer group keeping you where you're at and keeping you down versus you doing what you can do. So. All right. And my uncle has kind of said that a lot more colorful words but yeah okay okay so it sounds like you you have some suggestions right from other people no matter how colorful they might be um mm -hmm. what's the first step for you jerry um in changing that peer group what do you think that's going to take for you to make that first step well i i know i need uh, that's simple i know i know i need to get a job and i know i need to get into a really reputable construction company because I do know I'm good at construction. And I have, my, my dad said, once I get serious, he, I can have all his tools because he's retired. Um, and so I know that's my first step of what I got to do. All right. So that's really the big first step is kind of reaching out and starting that job search. Mm -hmm. All right. So let's make a plan. How do you feel about getting a plan together to maybe let's, help you facilitate that. Let's do it, Ms. Johnson. All right. So let's reiterate that change that you wanted to make was changing that friend group. Is that correct? Absolutely. You need okay. to get rid of those clowns. All right. So what are the most important reasons for you to make this change? Well, I just... I need money. Uh, dad, dad's already telling me I only have a limited time to get out of the house. Um, I, I just know when I wasn't drinking, uh, like I am now, I felt a lot better. I always had money. Um, I had more purpose. Okay, so I want to work. Um, I felt better. I wasn't drinking. And you mentioned that you felt that you had more purpose, right? Yeah. Okay. Those are some great reasons to really put this plan into action. All right, so let's play the tape forward, like a year from now. If you make this change now, what are some ways your life would be better? Hmm. Well, I, I, hopefully I'm, working for a really good construction company, um, working on the things I need to work on to get better as a, in construction, um, maybe moving up. I don't know. Say more about that. What part? Working with the construction company. What is that going to bring well, to your life? Uh, well, that was part of the problem. Why I quit was that it was a asshole foreman that I didn't like and he didn't know he didn't know how to treat people and he was not good at what he was doing um so I want to work for a company that well maybe that my uncle knows and that he knows it's a good foreman or a good company so that I won't have that conflict or worry so I think that'll okay. be important for me to stick with it too so okay all right so having a good job, working for a good, reputable company, right? Mm -hmm. All right. So let's talk about some things that you can do to support that goal of really getting out there and getting a job. So what's the first step that you could take to kind of get this process started? Well, it's funny, Miss Johnson, why we're even talking about all this, but I have a, a date with my uncle. And, and my dad tonight for dinner 
to probably really talk about all this and get some uh, referrals or have my uncle call. Get, my uncle is still in the business. Um, so to get him to um, make a couple calls for me and hopefully get a couple interviews for some companies that he knows is really the, the foremans are good and the managers are good. Well, that's going to happen tonight. Okay. So talking to your uncle about referrals for an interview. Yeah. Very nice. All right. Yep. So yep. you mentioned that you guys are meeting tonight, which is perfect. Yep. Um, yeah. what might be a deadline, a good deadline for you to have this conversation? Well, it's going to happen tonight, but okay. you okay. know, it'll be, you know, other conversations probably in a week or so, but okay. for me, it's, it's tonight. All right. So I'm ready. So, all right. You're ready for that conversation. Awesome. Yep. Do you want to you know, role play having that conversation, or do you feel confident having that conversation with your uncle? About oh yeah, that? I grew up with my uncle. He, I have a great relation. Yeah, I know he. He makes a lot of sense when we talk. So I'm. I think it'll just be a natural conversation. So, and him and him and my dad are more like you. Really got to be serious if you want to make this step to to doing construction full time. So okay, so they're I think, kind of. I think I'm okay. All that. right. That sounds great. Well, that's something that we can always revisit. If there's something on this list that you want to continue to work on with me, that's part of this process as well. Um, yep. And we could definitely add in a role play if there's something that you wanted to continue to work with. But it sounds like you really have that under control. Yep. You sound confident in being able to have that conversation. Maybe it might be about interviewing when that comes. So. Okay. That's a good thing. So yeah. do we want to add that in as something for sure. another step that we can kind of follow up, follow up on in the future? Sure. Oh, all right. So practicing, what does that sound like for you? Is it practicing interview questions? What does yeah. that look like? Probably practicing how to answer interview questions. All right. So what would be a good end date for that? step what do you think a couple weeks maybe. maybe okay so maybe the end of october yeah okay that work. and that you kind of mentioned having some time to practice that mm -hmm. perfect all right so let's do this next time we meet bring some interview questions in and we can practice and role play that perfect so we're going to stick right here with two i don't want to overwhelm you with this but You've okay. got a few things that you can follow up on for next time um, when okay. we meet again. So I want okay. you to refer back to this. This will be in your tools on devices and you can add that check mark um, for that date that you complete that step. And so I'll okay. continue to work with you on that as well. Okay. But let's talk a little bit about some challenges. So what are some challenges mm -hmm. um, that could get away or get in the way of you following through with this plan? Um, I don't know. I'm pretty determined. Um, I, I actually miss doing construction work, but I, the interviewing is a little scary for me. I could talk well with you, but I kind of get tongue tied when I do interviews. Um, you know, trying to hold off the peer group until then and maybe disappearing for a little while until I get the job. Um, Maybe go stay at my sister's or something for a little while. Okay. Um, All right. Yeah, that'd be about, that's about it. It's perfect. I'm glad you mentioned that because that's something that we're going to just kind of loop in. Who are some people who can help you with your plan? You mentioned staying at your sister's. Yeah. I think Say if more about that. Well, they, they, she lives way on the other side of town, so they don't know where she lives and so they wouldn't have access to me and I wouldn't have access to them. Um, okay. You know, I, I mean, my, my dad, my uncle are extremely helpful and supportive of me getting into construction, so. All right, very nice. So let's talk a little bit more about your sister. What are some ways that your sister could offer some help with you? For just, let me, just let me live with her for a little while until I get okay. into a job. 
Very nice. All right. That's great that you, sounds like you have her support in all of this. So that's yep. definitely helpful. Yep. How about your dad and your uncle? Well, dad, dad said that it, I, I can just get all his old construction equipment, which he's got really good stuff. So that's um, an issue that I don't need to worry about with buying all my own stuff. So. All right. So your dad is willing to part with all of his old tools and equipment to support yeah. you. Very yeah, nice. And, and he's cool with letting me still store it at their place. So. Very nice. All right. And how about your uncle? Well, he's, he's just great because he, he's still in the business. So he knows everybody in the industry and they know him. Um, so he can, you know, is pivotal in helping me find the right place to work at. So, and as a mentor, like if there's something I don't know how to do, I know I can go over to his place and he can show me really quick how to do it. So. All right. Very nice. So you've got your uncle, your dad, and your sister as kind of those supports. Yep. Um, and we've got them listed in here so we can always revisit that if those challenges come up you know, you've got it right here to kind of come back to. Okay. So Jerry, how are you going to know that your plan is working? When I'm working. When you're working. <laughs> yep. All right. When I got that job and I got through that interview. So, um, All right. yeah. All right. Very nice. So let's talk about ways that you can celebrate you reaching your goal. Cause it's important for us to have that positive affirmation when we get when we get things done we want to give ourselves that reward right yeah right. well my I mean, yeah go ahead sorry it's really yeah. important for us to do that right because it builds our confidence it makes us feel good about ourselves so when you reach that goal what do you think would be a good celebration um i, I well i don't know my uncle mentioned you know him and dad will take me out to a nice dinner at the steakhouse and on, awesome uh, yeah so that's something to look forward dad another one would be again dad said if if i'm really serious and do this then i can also have his old construction truck so i would have Very reliable nice. transportation and be able to haul everything so so there's some incentive all right so you got lots of incentive there very nice. All right. So Jerry, I'm going to save this. Okay. Um, and we're going to revisit this again next time we meet and we'll talk about um, the goal. And then we'll also maybe role play some of those interview questions and kind of get you prepped for that interview process. All right. All right, Jerry. Thanks for coming in. Thank you, Miss Johnson. I do appreciate your support. Thank you so much for rolling through that and just having this on the screen too, so we could all see as you went through how it just really prompts you, right? And walks you through each one and you're entering in. Um, and I love that, and Amy brought this up earlier, let's say, you know, somebody doesn't have that or can't get on there, you can screenshot it, right? Um, so just the, the usability of that is, is really great. And just showing how with Jerry, the ideal client, um, <laughs> can really walk through and come up with those answers. But Amber, those open-ended questions just really yeah. in, in probing him to, to come up with those ideas himself um, is a great example of how we can do these things remotely yeah. um, with our clients. So, Well, and so, it really spoke to, she honed in that I was ready to make a change too. So, you know, it's that whole piece of evoking change talk and then doing it so and it, she did a great job of bringing me through I didn't have to do real detailed answers and she just went with it and added on a little bit when she needed to so nice work Amber so. well thank you Jerry you are a mm -hmm. wonderful client to work with <laughs> <laughs> that wasn't that how all the clients are in Washington County <laughs> nearly all of them <laughs> Well, I just want to thank all the panelists today for being here and the willingness to really talk in depth about 
all of their knowledge and strategies and um, ways that they have, things they've overcome and ways that they've moved forward um, during this pandemic and sharing it broadly here in this space um, so that people can see what are some tools or things I can do. And then additionally, as uh, April offering some of those tools up as well so that we can share the wealth with each other and really um, go back to our agencies and, and find ways to, to be successful with our clients to help them ob obviously with our community. So I just appreciate and wanna uh, thank all the panelists for taking the time today for the space. I wanna thank everyone here that came um, and, and listened and, and received this knowledge to be here today and your willingness to, um, to engage and, and, and listen. And those that offered questions too um, along the way to really prompt some other pieces that really came up. So. I want to thank everyone. We will share this recording. I'm not sure how that will go out uh, quite yet, um, but we'll get this recording saved some way um, and work that through the networks so that you can share this far and wide through Minnesota for other people um, throughout the state that want to know how, how can I work successfully with my clients? And I want to hear how other people did that. So thank you all again for being here. Um, and Again, we'll move forward with the recording and some communication, but otherwise, everyone have a really great day. Thank you so much. Bye, everyone.